I was completely taken aback when my husband Jonathan suggested out of the blue that I should move back to my parents' house, even though they were already living with us. His sudden declaration left me speechless. He seemed to think he was being perfectly logical though, and with a blunt tone, he asked, Do you have a problem with that? Don't argue with me. I'm fine with divorcing you if you do. His behavior had grown cold and distant recently, and I'd been wrestling with my own frustrations. I had even considered the possibility of divorce, but I never imagined he'd be the one to force me out of our home. After all, I was the one covering our $3,200 monthly expenses. Did he even recognize that? As I stood there in disbelief, he grew more agitated and demanded, leave this house now. My parents won't feel comfortable with you here. I couldn't understand why I was suddenly the one who had to go, but in that moment, I agreed. Fine, I'll take all my things with me, I replied. He seemed satisfied with my compliance and, without another word, said, then do it, before walking away. Without hesitation, I contacted a store to sell my belongings. My name is Betty, and I live with Jonathan, who's three years older than me. We met through mutual friends, and what started as a casual introduction turned into an entire day spent together. Jonathan had shared his dream of becoming a voiceover artist, and I was drawn to his deep, soothing voice. I've always been fond of such tones. He must have felt the same connection because we exchanged numbers and began planning more outings. Before long, we were in a relationship without ever formally discussing it. At the time, I had just graduated from college and started my career. Dating someone with more life experience like Jonathan felt exciting. My friend Laura voiced concerns about our age difference, but I brushed it off. It's only three years, I told her, and I genuinely liked Jonathan, feeling confident in his affection for me. Laura eventually came around, trusting my judgment. Jonathan and I had been together for two years when he brought up the idea of marriage. I had already told my parents about him, including his age, and they were eager to meet him, hopeful about our future together. I often wondered when he would propose, and in typical Jonathan fashion, it happened during one of his regular visits to my apartment. We were just lounging around, enjoying each other's company. It wasn't the most romantic setting, but it felt right for us. Then, without much fanfare, he popped the question. I casually responded, sure, let's get married. Maybe we both approached the idea with a laid-back attitude. After Jonathan proposed, we made the usual rounds of visiting each other's parents. But when we went to his family's house, it quickly became clear that I didn't quite mesh with them. The house was filled with decor meant to imitate old-fashioned luxury, but it all felt rather forced. His parents wore expensive clothes and flashy jewelry, giving off the impression that they were trying too hard to appear wealthy. It was clear our tastes and values were different, and I doubted we'd ever truly get along. During the visit, Jonathan's mother even made a hurtful comment about my appearance. I was stunned by how the family of the man I intended to marry could behave that way. But in the end, I reminded myself that I was marrying Jonathan, not his family. We were set to start our own lives together, and if I didn't enjoy being around his parents, I could always limit my time with them. With that thought, I decided not to let it bother me too much. After our wedding, as we settled into our new condo, I began to notice that Jonathan seemed distracted. One day out of the blue, he asked, Hey, what was that woman in the blue dress at our wedding? Given that several guests had worn blue, I couldn't immediately figure out who he meant. Which woman in a blue dress? I asked, trying to jog my memory. You know, the one who gave a speech as your best friend, he clarified. Are you talking about Laura? I replied, realizing that Laura had, in fact, worn a blue dress. Yes, that's her, Jonathan said, though his tone carried a hint of unease. I was puzzled. What's wrong with Laura? I asked, sensing something off. Oh, it's nothing, he said, brushing it off. Just something I noticed the other day. I thought I saw someone who looked like her on my way to work, Jonathan said, his expression a bit unsettled. It reminded me she was your best friend who spoke at our wedding. I was confused by Jonathan's sudden curiosity about Laura and his flustered response, but before I could ask more, he laughed awkwardly and retreated to his room. Not long after, Laura called me, brimming with excitement. Betty, my boyfriend's coming back to Canada next year, she exclaimed. Laura and her boyfriend had been together since high school. Having known each other since childhood, he had moved away in middle school, but they stayed close first through letters and then by reconnecting in high school when he finally confessed his feelings for her. I had always loved hearing about Laura's romantic adventures. 
Even though her boyfriend had been working abroad for a few years, their relationship had remained strong. Do you think he'll propose when he's back? I teased. Laura giggled. Maybe, but you're always jumping ahead, Betty. Well, if he does, make sure to invite me to the wedding, I joked. I'll expect another heartfelt speech like the one you gave at mine. Oh, of course, Laura said, laughing. But don't set the bar too high. We both chuckled, sipping our tea and enjoying the familiar comfort of our friendship. Laura had always been there for me and I for her sharing our lives and supporting each other through any struggles. Around this time, though, I began noticing some changes in Jonathan's routine. He started coming home later and later, working late again tonight. I asked one evening as he walked through the door. Yeah, why? Do you think I shouldn't work? He snapped, a defensive edge in his voice. Jonathan had never let go of his dream of becoming a voiceover artist, and while I admired his dedication, it was starting to take its toll. He juggled several part-time jobs to pay for his voice artist training, but all his earnings went straight to that, leaving me to cover all of our living expenses. Saving money together felt impossible, and the strain was becoming more obvious with each passing day. As his hours at his part-time job grew longer, my concern deepened. Hey, haven't you been working too much lately? I asked, trying to sound supportive. They shouldn't be making you do so much overtime, especially for a part-time job. He brushed me off, unwilling to discuss it, but deep down, I knew his relentless pursuit of his dream was starting to create a rift between us, both financially and emotionally. One day, I finally spoke up. I told you, I'm worried. I'm fine. More money is always better. Just keep your opinions to yourself. Jonathan snapped back, his tone colder than ever. By that point, he had grown distant, barely acknowledging me, and had stopped using my name altogether. He only referred to me as you when we spoke, and I had hoped that marriage would bring more warmth more connection between us. Instead, his words had turned sharp and dismissive. The gentle, soothing voice I had fallen in love with had become rough and harsh. Jonathan had also been drinking more, and his voice even sounded hoarse at times, a concerning issue for someone aspiring to be a voiceover artist. Yet he showed no interest in discussing his health or making any changes. Conversations with him became rare, and eventually, he started avoiding me completely, even when we were in the same room. Amidst all of this, Laura called me, saying she had something important to discuss. I was eager to meet up, desperate for a break from the tension at home. We decided to meet at a cafe, and when we arrived, Laura carefully chose a booth with a clear view of the counter and staff. You picked this spot on purpose? I asked, noticing her cautious demeanor. Yes, she replied, her expression serious. I want a place where the staff can see if there's someone suspicious around. A suspicious person? Is that what you wanted to talk about? I asked, growing concerned. Laura nodded, her face tight with worry. She explained that ever since she left her job a month ago, she had felt like someone was following her. Lately, she even sensed she was being watched on her days off. The reason she picked that particular booth was because she feared the person might try to eavesdrop on our conversation. Have you gone to the police? I asked. I did, but since there's been no direct contact, they said there isn't much they can do, she sighed. What about your boyfriend? Isn't he coming back next month? Maybe he can help, I suggested, hoping she had someone nearby for support. I'm planning to talk to him, but I wanted to talk to you first. You're closer, she explained, her voice tinged with unease. The weight of Laura's words hung in the air, and as we sat there, I realized that both of us were caught in unsettling situations her with a potential stalker, and me with a marriage that seemed to be unraveling before my eyes. I understood Laura's need for immediate support. She hadn't gotten a clear look at her stalker, making the situation even more frightening. She couldn't tell if the person was a man or a woman, and the constant fear was wearing her down. Determined to help, I discreetly started watching from a distance hoping to identify who was following her. At the same time, I was wrestling with my own troubled relationship with Jonathan, but I couldn't bring myself to talk about it yet. Then, I made a shocking discovery. The person shadowing Laura was none other than my husband Jonathan. He had always claimed to be working late, but I noticed that after his shifts, he would linger near Laura's workplace and follow her when she left. Seeing him do this was beyond unsettling. The man responsible for my best friend's fear was my own husband. Jonathan's behavior completely shattered my perception of him. The man I had once loved, 
the one I thought I knew, now seemed like a stranger. That disturbing grin he wore as he followed Laura chilled me to the bone, and the love I had once felt turned to ice. I knew I had to tell Laura the truth. I urged her to move immediately for her safety. With help from her colleagues, we arranged for someone to drive her from the underground parking lot to her new residence, taking every precaution to ensure she remained safe. As Laura made her escape, Jonathan's frustration grew. His anger eventually erupted. My parents are going to live here, so you need to go back to your parents' house, he demanded one day, completely out of the blue. I was shocked by the sudden and unreasonable ultimatum. If you have a problem with that, then I'm fine with divorcing you, he spat, losing his temper. Though I had already considered divorce many times before, hearing him say it so callously hit me hard. The reality of our crumbling relationship finally became undeniable. I couldn't believe Jonathan thought he could just kick me out of the home I was paying for, $3,200 a month, every single month. Did he even remember that? I gave him a skeptical look, but he just snapped, just leave already. My parents can't move in if you're still here. His words didn't make any sense. Why do I have to leave? I don't understand, I said, trying to keep my frustration in check. Okay, I'll take everything I bought with me, I replied calmly, despite the whirlwind of emotions inside me. Jonathan, impatient, waved me off. Hurry up, then, he muttered as he walked away. Wasting no time, I contacted a local buyback service. The next day, they arrived at our apartment. Jonathan watched with a smirk, thinking I was just packing up to leave. His smugness quickly evaporated when the workers began evaluating all our furniture and appliances, everything except for the items in his room. Once the staff finished, they handed me a quote. The total value is $299,000, the worker said. Okay, sell it all, I replied without hesitation. Jonathan's shock was instant. He grabbed my arm, his voice panicked. Why are you selling everything? My parents are going to live here. How can they without any furniture? I pulled my arm free and looked him dead in the eye. What do you mean? When we got married, you told me you were broke because of your acting classes. You asked me to handle the rent, the furniture, and all our living expenses. Now, with your parents moving in, you can cover the $3,200 a month yourself, right? Jonathan went pale as reality hit him. Desperate to save face, he tried to regain his composure. You think talking about money will stop the divorce? Who do you think you are? He sneered. I've already gotten close to a rich lady, he added, striking a ridiculous pose. His words made my blood boil, but I stayed calm, remembering how Jonathan had been stalking Laura recently. If that was his idea of getting close, his perception of relationships was more twisted than I thought. Laura, who came from a wealthy family, her grandfather a successful businessman, and her father his successor, never flaunted her money. She lived just like the rest of us, modest and down-to-earth. Jonathan, however, must have found out about Laura's background and saw her as a ticket to the life he wanted. It infuriated me that he thought wealth made someone more desirable, but I knew the truth. Laura would never be interested in him. She had been with her high school boyfriend for years and he was returning soon with plans to marry her. Jonathan's delusions would crumble soon enough, and I wasn't going to be around to witness the fallout. When I mentioned that Laura felt uneasy because someone had been stalking her, Jonathan was taken aback. He was shocked to hear that Laura found him creepy and that they weren't as close as he believed. I always walked Laura home, he protested defensively. You're lucky I didn't call the police, I shot back, my tone sharp. But I didn't know she had a boyfriend. He's been away, she picked me over someone she doesn't know, Jonathan insisted, trying to justify his misunderstanding of their relationship. They've been writing letters since they were kids and talk almost every day. Unlike you, who only has part-time jobs, her boyfriend is successful. Even her dad likes him. I pointed out, Jonathan's expression turned profoundly sad as the reality of the situation sank in. It was clear that his fantasies about forming a relationship with Laura were just that, delusions. As the movers arrived to take our belongings, Jonathan seemed somewhat relieved. I guess you're all I've got now. You'll always support my dream of becoming a voiceover artist, won't you? He asked, attempting to appear unfazed. I met his gaze with steely determination. Sorry, but I've already begun divorce proceedings. From now on, we should communicate through our lawyers, I said coldly. Thinking I still had feelings for him, Jonathan clung to me. Don't say that. 
Haven't we been getting along all this time? We've been getting along ever since you discovered that my best friend, Laura, is wealthy. You've become distant and started spending time with her right after our wedding. I realize now that I made a mistake. I continued, my voice steady. Jonathan broke down in tears, and despite being older, his childish weeping only made him less endearing to me. I could no longer bear to be near him. Enough, I snapped. I've also informed your uncle Unl about the divorce. You know he's a tough man. Well, he's decided to work for him, which means I can no longer support your voiceover dreams. You barely practice as it is. It might be time to accept reality and stay away from Laura. If you don't, I'll call the police. With those final words, I left, determined not to look back. For now, I would stay with my parents, though I considered moving closer to my workplace if I found a suitable place. Meanwhile, as expected, Jonathan ended up working for his uncle and his parents who had plans to rely on him financially after his marriage to Laura, also moved in with him, all of them now working for his uncle. It seemed that exploiting others was a family trait. I felt a wave of relief wash over me as I escaped that toxic environment. Age wasn't the significant factor. I vowed to be more cautious in choosing my next partner. On a happier note, after settling things with Jonathan, Laura invited me to her wedding. She introduced me to her long-term boyfriend, and I genuinely wished them both happiness.